Good evening and welcome. I'm John Hunt. Um, we've been doing short literary readings in advance of the um, these six lectures. And I have one for you this evening. I have no idea how well or badly it may relate to the lecture that comes after. We haven't really been able to plan that very well. Um, but I want to read to you a couple of pages from the beginning of a book by David James Duncan titled My Story is Told by Water, um, which was published in 2001. I was born in a hospital located on the flanks of a volcanic cone. This cone, named Mount Tabor, looks as innocent as an overturned teacup as it rises over a densely populated section of southeast Portland, Oregon. Decades before my birth, scientists had, of course, declared the cone to be unimpeachably extinct. The hospital, however, afforded a nice view of another cone 35 miles away in the same volcanic system, also declared extinct in those days, Mount St. Helens. <laughs> Forgive my suspicion of certain unimpeachable declarations of science. My birth cone's slopes were drained by tiny seasonal streams, which, like most of the creeks in that industrialized quadrant of Portland, were buried in underground pipes long before I arrived on the scene. There were also three small reservoirs on Mount Tabor's slopes containing the water that bathed me at birth, water I would drink for 18 years, water that gave me life. But this water didn't come from Mount Tabor or from the surrounding hills or even from the aquifer beneath. It came via concrete and iron flumes from the Bull Run River, which drains the slopes of the Cascade Mountains 40 miles away. I was born then without a watershed. On a planet held together by gravity and fed by rain, a planet whose every creature depends on water and whose every slope works full time for eternity to create creeks and rivers, I was born with neither. The creeks of my birth cone were invisible, the river from somewhere else entirely. Of course, millions of Americans are now born this way. And many of them grow up without creeks, live lives lacking intimacy with rivers, and become well-adjusted, productive citizens, even so. <laughs> Not me. The dehydrated suburbs of my boyhood felt as alien to me as Mars. The arid industrial life into which I was being prodded looked to me like the life of a Martian. What is a Martian? Does Mars support intelligent life? I had no idea. My early impression of the burgeoning burbs and herbs around me was of internally combusting hordes of dehydrated beings manufacturing and moving unnecessary objects from one place to another in order to finance the rapid manufacture and transport of more unnecessary objects. Running water, on the other hand, felt as necessary to me as food, sleep, parents, and air. And on the cone of my birth, all such water had been eliminated. I didn't rebel against the situation. Little kids don't rebel. That comes later, along with the hormones. <laughs> what I did was hand build my own rivers, breaking all neighborhood records in the process for the amount of time spent running a garden hose. In the beginning, in southeast Portland, there was nothing much there at all. Dehydrated Martians seemed to cover the place completely. So I would fasten the family hose to an azalea bush at the uphill end of one of my mother's sloping flower beds, turn the faucet on as hard as mom would allow, and watch hijacked Bull Run River water spring forth in an arc and start cutting in a minuscule audible river down through the bed. I'd then camp by this river all day. As my river ran and ran, the thing my mother understandably hated and I understandably loved began to happen. Creation. The flower bed topsoil slowly washed away, and a stream bed of tiny colored pebbles gradually appeared. 
a bed that soon looked just like that of a genuine river, complete with tiny point bars and cut banks, meanders and eddies, fishy looking riffles, slow, po slow pools. It was a nativity scene, really. The entire physics and fluvial genius of gravity meets water meets earth incarnating in perfect miniature. I built matchbook-sized hazelnut rafts and cigarette, cigarette butt-sized elderberry canoes, launching them on my river, let them ride down to the gargantuan driveway puddle that served as my Pacific. I stole a three-inch tall blue plastic cavalry soldier from my brother's Fort Apache set, cut the stock off his upraised rifle so that only the long flexible barrel remained, tied a little thread to the end of the barrel to serve as fly line and sent the soldier fishing. <laughs> I'd then lie flat on my belly, cheek to the ground and stare at this U.S. cavalry dropout, thigh deep in his tiny river, rifle rod high in the air, line working in the current, stare till I became him, stare till in the sunlit riffle we actually hooked and landed tiny sun glint fish. Shut off that hose, my mother would eventually shout out the kitchen window. You've turned the whole driveway into a mud hole. Poor woman, I'd think. It's not a mud hole. It's a tide flat. <laughs> I'd, gra I'd gladly turn the hose off, though. That's how I got the tide to go out. I'd then march my river soldier out onto the flat to dig for clams. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that possibly connects pretty nicely with our topic about whether we're going to run out of water or not. We'll know whom to blame if we do. Uh, David Duncan. Uh, welcome everybody to the last in this year's series about Western waters. I'm really excited to welcome you all here to our final lecture. Uh, and I think we're going to learn a whole lot from this young man, Marco Manetta. I want to ask you to do the usual things. Turn off your cell phones. Um, please drop over to the Mansfield Library or the President's Office to view the uh, art which is on display from the Montana, the Montana Museum of Art and Culture. And also I have good news about the reception tonight after the, um, after the uh, lecture. So possibly some of you only came because you heard there was a reception after. But you don't have to put up your hands if you did. It's going to be in the UC rooms 330 to 332. So you just go out of the theater, turn left, go through a double door, double wooden door, go to the end of the hallway and turn left again, and then just shout, where are the water people? And we'll come and get you. And it should be a lot of fun. So um, how many of the lecturers are here tonight? Robert, Robin? Robert Stubble, Stubblefield is here, and Marco is here, of course. Anybody else here? Oh, oh yeah, Bill Wisner. Uh, maybe that's it. Um, we, we can't have Michelle Brian Mudd because she has a, a child care thing going. So in any case, I just want to introduce you to you our ultimate lecture, the ultimate lecture of the series, uh, Marco Manetta. And I was just asking Marco, because we've never run into each other at all before, how long he had been on the campus. And it turns out I think he's the most recent av arrival of any of us, arriving in 2009 from UC Davis, uh, where he had a postdoctoral fellowship. Um, and you'll notice that his uh, accent is not Montana, or even UC Davis, but Spain. So um, uh, we're fortunate to have him here because he fell in love with, I'm sure, a wonderful woman in California, and the rest is history. So Marco, come and talk to us about whether we're going to run out of water. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> and uh, thank you all for, for attending tonight. Yeah, I'm going to talk today about uh, water and agriculture, which are the two big topics that drive my research activity in, in my research lab. And it seems odd that we're talking about running out of water when we know that our planet is 75% uh, covered in, the, in that liquid, right? And the truth is that for an immense amount of water, that we have in the planet, we can only use a tiny bit of the water. So if you look closely at the, uh, where the water is located in the different storages in the planet, we see that 96.5% of all the water is 
uh, containing the ocean. So the water is too salty uh, to be used for drinking or for irrigation. Right, so the actual amount of water that is fresh water that is potentially usable is only 2.53% of all the water in the world. But the thing that gets worse, because from this 2.53%, the largest chunk, 68% of this 2.53, is located in glaciers, mainly in Antarctica and in Greenland. It's too far to be retrieved and to be used. The next big storage of fresh water is our groundwater systems. And we use some of it, but most of the groundwater, in the, our groundwater system is too deep to be retrieved economically. So we're only using a portion of it. And the water that we see most immediate, that we use the most, is water that we see in rivers, right? This accounts from 0.006% of all the total fresh water in the world. So overall, we're using just about 1% of the immense amount of water that we have in the planet. Because it's such a tiny sliver, we naturally get very concerned of the impact that climate change might have on our water resources, right? And uh, scientists tell us that one of the side effects of climate change is gonna be an intensification of the hydrologic cycle. And what this means is that wetter, plants of, uh, wetter parts of the planet, this is the blue regions, are gonna get wetter, and drier parts of the planet, which is the red regions, are gonna get drier. So we wanna know whether we're in the wet or the dry region, right? So um, one feature of our climate models is that, is that they work very well to produce global scale predictions, right? But the information that we need to run policy decisions and to manage water, they are not done at the global scale. They're done at regional and local scales. And there, our models are not so accurate. Why is that? Why our models don't work so well? at the regional scale and they do that at the global scale. So most of the world looks like this. So what we have is a layer of the atmosphere that is over, over you know, like on top of the uh, oceanic layer. So what we have is a very uh, clean and impeded media where we can solve our equations. And the contact between the atmosphere and the surface that is liquid, right, uh, the exchanges of water in this contact uh, it's only dependent on the amount of energy available, not depending on the amount of water available, because there's plenty of water. This contrasts with the situation that we have in terrestrial systems. In terrestrial systems, the topography is a little bit more complicated. There is more obstructions. Now some sections of the land are saturated like streams and, and, uh, and lakes and marshlands. Some parts are not saturated. Now the exchanges of water and the exchanges of energy get a little bit more complicated. And then we have vegetation that also alters the partition of energy and water in the landscape. So the situation is already complicated. It gets even more complicated when we put mountains in our landscape. And now we not only have to deal with all this complexity, but now we have to deal also with very steep topographic gradients that produce very fast changes in the amount of precipitation inputs that we are receiving. So they become very difficult to monitor. So most of the uh, water that we use in, uh, in Montana is uh, very nicely stored for free in the mountains during the winter in the form of snow, and then gets slowly released when we need it most in the spring and in the summer, right? The thing is, in order to know how much water is gonna be released, how much water we have to run our agricultural operations or to produce hydropower, we need to know how much water is contained in our mountains in the snowpack. And the thing is, because of the steep elevation gradients, the spatial variability of snow is very, very large. How do we measure it? So um, the measurement techniques that we have are still quite primitive, if I may say so. So there's two ways. Snow courses that are maintained by the National Resource and Conservation Service, and this is basically small transects between two markers. And uh, where some guys, some technicians go, right, with some probes, measure the snow depth and the snow density, and then they calculate the amount of water in the snow right along the transect. Um, they give us an idea of how the amount of snow changes in time on these small sections, right, in, the, in these small snow courses, right? But they are not, this information is not updated very, very frequently. So the, the other way to measure is uh, through ground observations. And the main network that we have to, um, to uh, automatic network that we have to observe snow is the snow telemetry network 
which is what we call this no-tail network. And this is basically stations that have a pillow on the ground. And this pillow is filled with some liquid that doesn't freeze in the winter. And uh, so when the snowpack accumulates on top of, the, um, of that snow pillow, it will start squeezing the liquid, increasing the pressure. And we have a pressure transducer. It's like a machine that measures the pressure in the liquid and transforms that into weight of snow, which is the equivalent weight in water. Right? So there is something quite curious about those two ways we have to measure is that they have to be located in space and they have to be accessed by humans. So um, what is happening is that those locations of those instruments are not randomly sampling the space. They're sampling a very, some very specific locations that are chosen so it's safe for operators to go and fix the machine if it breaks in relatively flat areas, in areas that the machine is not going to be run by an avalanche right, and be broken that is close to uh, roads, so you can drive the pickup and with your tools, right? So by cherry picking those locations, we're introducing potentially a bias in our measurements that might be biasing our, estim our estimates of, of uh, snow that we have in the mountains. So if we look at the uh, distribution of snow tail sites in Montana, and this, each of these black dots here is the location of a snowtail site that has t more than 10 years of data, so we can use it to, uh, to check dynamics in, in, in the snow. And if we see how the snowtails, the number of snowtails per elevation band, we see that most of our snowtails are located at moderate to low elevations. There is only three snowtail sites monitoring areas higher than 2,300 meters. So uh, the thing is, most of our snow that we have in our landscape is located in high elevation regions. And not only this, these high elevation regions are the regions where the interannual variability of snow is the highest. It's where we are more uncertain of the amount of snow that is going to fall. And this is where we have the least number of stations. Right? So um, if we look at where Montana is, and if we look at the regional scale predictions, of the intensification of the hydrologic cycle. Uh, we're somewhere in the blue region here, which is the region that is supposed to be increasing the amount of precipitation that we are getting, like in the future, right? But we are not very far from the southwest that is going to see a decrease in precipitation. So it's very important to know if we exactly fall in the Pacific Northwest. So traditionally, we believe that we are in this section. We're going to see an increase in precipitation. And this is what the scientists have been telling us in a number of papers. So this is a very famous paper by Philip Moe that says that, yeah, so the projected changes in annual precipitation is going to be about 1% to 2% so, uh, for this century, right? There is another paper, it's got here, but yeah, so it says that this increase is going to be higher in regions with mountains. This is us. This is actually very good, right? Although there is a recent paper now that says that perhaps, no, we're, get, we're gonna get less water because there is a weakening of the westerlies, the winds that bring moisture from the ocean. And so they don't have enough strength to go up the mountain and release, and release precipitation. So there is less orographic enhancement and perhaps less precipitation. So what are the physics? What is driving this intensification of precipitation? And the physics are relatively easy, right? So if we increase temperature, what is happening is we're increasing the ability of the atmosphere to carry moisture, to carry water. And the reason for this is when you increase the temperature, you increase the energy of the molecules in the, uh, in the, uh, in the air. All the molecules that compose the, uh, the atmosphere jiggle faster. So the water molecules there have a harder time clustering together to form a drop, right, and fall. So if you have more energy, if the air is hotter, it can maintain more airborne molecules Air, water molecules before they start like clustering into, into a drop, right? So um, this physics tells us that yes, you can have more moisture in the atmosphere, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have more precipitation. We can have a world in the future where there is more water in the atmosphere, right? But the thing is, in mountain regions, when f air is forced up the mountain, the water gets cooler and sort of like gets compressed. And the effect is not very different from squeezing a sponge, right? If you, if you squeeze a sponge that is water, you're going to get more water out of it, right? So if we have more moisture in the air and we force it up the mountain, we're going to get more water. So the thing is, the increase in precipitation does not necessarily need to be um, 
uniform along the entire elevation gradient. Perhaps this increase is happening high up on top of the mountain, where we don't have any stations to monitor it, right? So we're pursuing this uh, kind of hypothesis in, uh, in my lab with one of my students. And what we've been doing is we've been comparing two models. The, here at the bottom, what we have is a model that um, um, reconstructs or calculates the spatial distribution of precipitation using ground observations. So what we do is we take the Snotter network, right, we interpolate between the points and reconstruct how precipitation is distributed in our landscape, right? This is Western Montana. This is the, uh, the uh, Montana-Idaho border, right? The bitter root would be here. So we would be, we would be somewhere around here, right? This, year, this model here on top, this simulation is also the distribution of precipitation. Uh, but this is now calculated using a, mo a model based on, based on physics. So we have now some equations that uh, calculate the movement of air, you know, that, that equations that govern the, the movement of the atmosphere and produce precipitation. So the model is independent of ground observations. And what we see between the two models is they, they agree very well in the spatial in the spatial component, the patterns is similar. What they disagree is in the amount of precipitation, red means more, the amount of precipitation that is falling in our tallest mountains. This is the, uh, this is the Mission Mountains here, so it says more red, more precipitation than here, right? And more precipitation in the mountains in Northern Idaho, right, than here. So you may say, well, you know, like the models is nothing more than a computer program, right? It may be wrong, and this is true, they could be wrong. So. Um, what we do is a little, a little bit more analysis. So this square here is exactly the same region here. And what we do is we uh, drive five cross sections, right? Those ha like do dot lines here. And these cross sections are represented by those five graphs here, west to east. And what we see in the black line in the background is the topography of those cross sections. The blue line is the precipitation that is simulated by the physics-based model, independent of our ground observations. And the pink model, it's the uh, model, is the, is the simulation, the precipitation that the, our ground-based model is giving us. And what we see is that the precipitation at low elevation, of mo both models agree very well in the amount of precipitation calculated for low elevation regions. And we expect that the ground-based model performs there very well because there is a lot of ground observations in those low elevation regions, right? But at high elevation, we see that there is a difference. Now, if our physics-based model performs well at low elevation, why should it perform bad at high elevation, right? So maybe what is happening is that the observation-based model that we use to calculate our volume of water in our mountains is carrying the low bias of the process is happening at low, at low elevation into the predictions at high elevation, right? So the scientific questions that we've been trying to answer in here at the University of Montana is how precise are our estimates of precipitation, right? How, how well can we calculate the volume of water that we have stored in our snowpack in the mountains, right? And the second question is, if there was to be a change in the amount of precipitation input that climate scientists tell us it's going to happen in Montana, could we actually detect it with our Snotel network, right? So what we do is we um, use some techniques that combine field observations with numerical models and advanced statistics, right, uh, to answer these questions. And uh, we're answering this for Western Montana. So this is the region that we're studying and we're using the network of observatories of the Snotel network, and this is all those red triangles here. So um, let me give you like a quick overview without the technical details of how um, the basics of the, of the, uh, of the um, methods that we use. We can run a model to predict how much precipitation is going to fall at each point in the landscape. Now, if we have a place where we have an observation at Snotel site, let's imagine this yellow triangle has a Snotel site, and someone asks us how much snow has been falling in that point. The first thing we can do is compare the observations that we've been getting with the model and evaluate how wrong or right the model is. But then we also have the actual value of precipitation, right? We can tell the amount of precipitation that we have. And the same thing if we, someone asks us in this point. But what if someone asks us in this point, right? So uh, there is several possibilities. We can run our model and, uh, and give our value there 
but we don't know if the value is good or not because we don't know exactly if the model works very well or not because we don't have an observation to compare. If the weather at, at the top of the mountain is coupled with the weather at the bottom of the mountain, right? So if when it rains here, it rains here, right? So then there is some information, something to be said about this from the information here. But if the weather here on top of the mountain is decoupled with the weather at the bottom of the mountain, and this happens very often, it's like sun in the valley and you look at snowball, it's like dumping there, right? Then the information that the snow tail is providing us bears no nothing resemblance with what is going on up here, right? So what we can do is run uh, an analysis that will calculate how far the information from each snotel site, how far this information carries, how informative in space each location of the snotel network is, and see how well we can constrain our model predictions with our observation network, right? So what I'm going to show you is, is, is the final map. So um, what we're so showing here is how precise we can be in our estimates of precipitation at each point in the landscape. So what we see is like the lighter colors that show sort of like white here is places where we can pin down really precisely the amount of precipitation that we have, right? So we can tell the amount of precipitation within like 10 millimeters, right? And this is all places that are very close where the snow sites are and typically low elevation. But if we go to the mountains, we see that the colors get a little redder, right? Pink and red. And this indicates that my uncertainty in my estimates goes a, goes a little bigger, right? So now we would have an uncertainty here would be like about between 120 and 160 millimeters. So what it means is that if I, uh, if I estimate that my precipitation here is 500 millimeters, I can be sure with some statistical range that my precipitation is going to go from 500 plus 160 or 500 minus 160. I have all this play there, right? All this uncertainty. So with this precision, with this, with this amount of, uh, of precision to, to capture changes, can we actually change, can we actually capture the predicted change that we're going to have in precipitation in the future. Well, that will depend on the size of the change, right? So if we run models on the difference between future and historical winter precipitation, which is the precipitation that produces the snow, right? We're going to see that the change is going to be very modest, right? In the next 50 years, this is future for mid-century. It's going to be very modest, like in the order of like a few, you know, like between zero and 80 millimeters for most of the region. Most of the change, most of the increase in precipitation is going to happen in the Mission Mountains here and in the mountains in Northern Idaho where we have big elevations, where we have this orographic enhancement, right? So um, can we capture, if, the, if this thing was going to be, was going to happen, if that change was true, if what the model is telling us is true, could we actually observe it? Could we be detecting it? And the answer is not very well. The places where we can detect this change with some uh, level of statistical guarantees is those places where I put the dots here. These are the only places where we can say, oh yeah, statistically I'm sure that there is a change in precipitation. And it's happening on the windward side of the Mission Mountains and a few spots here. But we have a big blind spot. Those changes will go undetected. We will not know if precipitation is going up or down because our snowtail network is insufficient to, uh, to, uh, to cover the entire uh, heterogeneity in the in the space. So, do we need more information, or what, do we need more precision, or why do we need more precision? Right. The answer is pretty clear. Um, would require we need to get the volume of precipitation and the change right if we are to maintain or increase the quality of life that we have, which is based on having plenty of cheap water. Right. So. Um, the decisions that uh, farmers make when they're running their operation, right, the, the crops that they're going to grow and the acreage, the land that they're going to allocate to each crop, right, will depend on the water they believe they're going to have for the season, right, and they rely on estimates from water managers. Also, the amount of hydroelectric production uh, that will cover a portion of our energy demand will, to a large extent, depend on the estimated available water. So um, also policy decisions, are we going to construct more water impoundments or less, right? Those are decisions that can negatively affect other users like fishery or recreation, right? That can affect tourism, right? So all those decisions, right, that are very critical 
need to have a, an appropriate, a, a very good estimate of the amount of water that we have available. So if I'm, up, if I'm, if I'm going to ask you how much, what's the percentage of Montana's water that agriculture uses, what would you say? 80, yeah, and that, that's correct. But if you say 10%, that's also correct. And if you say less than 1%, that's also correct. Because they depend on the baseline that you use to calculate the percentage, right? So it's 88% of the developed water supply. And the developed water supply is the water that we can, for which there is a legal framework that we can use, right? There is a water right allocated, right? It has a, the right legal status and for which we have enough capacity to convey and to store, right? So 88% of the developed water goes into agriculture. But the percentage is only 10% of the stream flow of some of our rivers. And it's certainly less than 1% of the total precipitation inputs that we're having. So there is plenty of water to go around. It's not, it's not, a, physical, it's not a physical limit what we're what we hitting. So um, the reason I'm interested in agriculture is because agriculture can have a larger impact on the hydrology of a region than the expected impact that climate change will have. So, um, and proper agriculture, ag agricultural policy can buffer, can mitigate some of the impacts that we are expecting from climate change, but it can also exacerbate, worsen the, those impacts, right? So, in order to have an appropriate packages, uh, uh, package of policy that, that makes sense, we need to understand how farmers react to policy and to economic and environmental drivers, right? So um, this is something that I'm very interested in. You know, like how different policies are affecting the hydrology of a region and uh, our food security, right, and our, and our food. So agriculture is the biggest industry in Montana. So our crops are worth more than $1.1 billion. And this is not taking into account livestock, right, which is worth more than $1.3 billion. Uh, and agriculture employs more than 35,000 people in a, in a state that is less than a million people, right? It's like very significant. So when I came here, um, I was surprised to see that a uh, disproportionate amount of those values is in uh, irrigated crops. But the amount of irrigation is very, very small. It's only 18% of all cropland. So I was thinking, well, maybe they're not irrigating more because there is no water. Right? So when I stumble upon this map here, you can see it very well, but this tells you the change in the number of irrigated acres by county. And the brown and tan colors indicate a decrease in the amount of irrigation. The green colors in indicate an increase. So Montana, during the 90s or the end of the previous century, not only has not expanded irrigation, but has been cont contracting it, really. So with the, with the, um, it's the most profitable like cropland and you're decreasing it, why is that? So I was talking to some of the hydrologists at the NRC and they told me that this is because nobody's maintaining the uh, irrigation infrastructure. So when, when the channels, you know, that go bad, nobody maintains them and people stop. There's other reasons, but yeah, so that's one of the ones that I, that I understood. So there is a potential opportunity for rural development there. So, so benefit from the high value of irrigated agriculture. So uh, how do we investigate the value, right, the opportunity there? So what I do is I collaborate with um, economists to build very sophisticated uh, models that permit a hydroeconomic analysis, permit to evaluate how much value there is in the water and how much crop you can grow, right? So the kind of questions that we are trying to answer is how climate variability, especially droughts, impact the crop mix and the amount of water that farmers see. So I'm also inter interested in how agricultural change impact the water availability and other water users, like fishery, hydropower, right? So we, in order to do that, we need to understand how farmers respond to water policy. If you're to control, you know, like the amount of water the farmers use and what they grow, you need to know how they respond to different policy drivers, right, R policy options. So the ultimate question that we're, we're trying to figure out is what package of policies would be the one that maximize the social and the economic benefits of irrigated agriculture while minimizing the environmental impacts of extracting water, right? And the, the negative impacts on other water users, right? So what we do is that we link together a number of models. So that the, the core is a, of our models is an agroeconomic model that simulates how farmers behave. It's an economic model that simulates how farmers allocate resources, what they're, what they're gonna decide to do when they're subject to uh, hydroclimatic, constraints, less water, as 
less rain or less water in the in the in the ditch, or two constraints that come from a policy nature, right? So, changing water rights, uh, environmental flow mandates, uh, changes in um, um, subsidies and production, and and so on and so forth, right? So, how are you going to react to all this? So, the uh, models that we use to uh, inform the economic model of how much water is available are models that can simulate the entire water distribution network in a region. So we can calculate how much water is available at each point in a channel and each time when farmers might need to retrieve it to irrigate, right? So those models are ran from information from climate models and we can evaluate how much water is actually available to farmers when they need it, right? Put water rights there, all that. The other thing that we do is we use remote sensing to observe agricultural activity in a region. And through remote sensing, we can get information on what crops farmers are growing, what, what acreage they are allocating to each crop, an approximation of the yield, how much water they're applying by observing evapotranspiration, right? So we use that to calibrate and um, per, to work our economic models so we are sure that they are actually representing reality. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run you through two tests that are going to show you how the models work and can, how, can they, how can those models be used to open opportunities on, uh, for water use. So the first run was done in a, in a farm in California uh, that is a 610 uh, commercial farm that has all crops under irrigation, right? So during baseline conditions, under normal conditions, the farmer is not water constraints. So he has all the water to, uh, to irrigate the crops and he even leaves some of the water in the ditch right for another farmer. So he's growing four crops, alfalfa, wheat, corn, and tomato. And we're going to simulate how they allocate three inputs, land, water, and labor. These are the decision variables that we're going to study, right? So uh, what the model produces is um, a distribution, a probability distribution of how farmers are going to allocate land this is the first row of graphs here. Water, this is the second row. And labor, this is the third row for each of the crops. Alfalfa, first column, wheat, corn, and tomato. And what we, the model gives us is the probability that they're going to do that, right? So the, what the model says is that the farmers are going to be most probably allocating 180 acres to alfalfa, and more probably, more probably 190 acres to wheat, between 100 and 120 acres to corn. They're going to be allocating about 1,800 acre feet of water to irrigate the alfalfa, about 450 to irrigate uh, wheat, and they're going to allocate about 1,500 hours of labor, right, and so on and so forth. So if you're wondering if the model actually works, we can compare that to what the farmer is actually doing. And this is what we see in this red line there. So this is the observations of what farmer actually decides to do, given the price of the different crops that they're growing, right, and the price of inputs to grow those crops. So now that we have some more confidence that the model actually simulates the behavior of farmers, we're going to run two policy scenarios, two new water allocation rules that result in a scenario one, a 30% reduced access of the farmer to water, and the second scenario, a 50% reduction in the amount of water that the farmer can access. How are farmers going to react to this? So we run the model. And what we see here now is uh, the change in allocation with respect to the baseline. So the baseline now is this, the red line that indicates 0% change. Towards the left is negative change, so minus 10%, minus 20%, minus 30% change, right? For, again, land, water, this line here, labor, right, for the different crops. And the blue distribution is for the 30% reduction, and the green distribution is for the 50% reduction. And what farmers do, is when they find that they're restricted with water, they're going to reduce the acreage of the crops that are more, the most water demanding and that have a relatively low market value, right? So the first thing they're going to do is going to reduce the amount of land that they are allocating to alfalfa. And they're going to reduce even more the amount of water that they are allocating to alfalfa, right? So they're even going to reduce it more than they reduce land. So they are irrigate suboptimally. What they're going to do is they're going to save this water and reallocate it to the crops they have the highest value, right? In that case, it's wheat and corn. So you see, like, for the 30% reduction, they are almost not, cha not changing the acreage allocated to, uh, to wheat, right? It's very close to the red line. And uh, the amount of water, they try to get, maintain the wheat happy because it has value, right? Something for corn and tomatoes. So that's their allocation. The other thing that they do is they reduce costs. 
by hiring less people on the most demanding uh, on the most demanding uh, labor demanding crops. Now, because they have reduced the area on on alfalfa, right? They don't need to hire these very many people, so they reduce the labor that they hire for this crop and reallocate to other crops, right? So if you're going to see the um, summary of the impact of the reduction during the baseline scenario, the farmers had available about 2,300 acre feet. And they used only 2,060, so they were not water constrained, they left some water out. So if someone comes with an extra unit of water and tried to sell that unit of water to the farmer, this is where the shadow value is, the farmer would say, I would pay you $0 because I don't need it, right? I've, 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 less, I, I've let some water run down the ditch, right? Now, during the 30% reduction scenario, water becomes binding, become, becomes constraining. So now we have 1,600 acre, acre feet of water available to the farmer, and the farmer used them all. Now, if someone comes uh, with an extra acre feet of water, right, an extra unit of water, the farmer would pay $9 per extra unit of water on top of the market value. So they're starting to value water, right? So if you see the change the losses in net revenues for the farmer with respect to the baseline, you see that a 30% reduction only has a small impact on the net revenues. They're going to do 2.76% less, right? And the impact on agriculture and uh, on rural unemployment is still relatively modest, about 11%. So they're coping with the, with the reduction. Now, for a 50% reduction, water becomes even more binding, right? So now they only have 1,100 acre feet of water available. They, of course, use it all. Now, if someone comes with a unit of water, they are starting to value water big time, right? They would pay $25 on top of market value, right? And their losses in net revenues are starting to become significant, right? More than 10%. And the effect on agricultural employment can be more severe, right? So their unemployment is increasing, or he's hiding 30% less people. So that, that the, the, the bottom line here is that the uh, impact of redu mm, reduced access to water on farmers is not linear, right? 30% reduction in water doesn't mean a 30% reduction in their profits, right? And uh, the, the impact doesn't scale linearly. The other big important uh, thing that we've learned is this one from a second case, uh, case scenario. The if you don't have uh, allocation rules, if you don't have a policy to allocate water to different users, the l relative location of your farm will make a huge difference on whether you're going to go bankrupt or not. So this is a, um, this is a, uh, a research site in, a, in Brazil, and they have a, a system, an agricultural system, that is very, very similar to the one in Montana. So what we have here, they grow different crops, obviously, but, but you know, like this, it's a ranching system. So we have four farmers um, in, this, in this basin. The basin has a stream that runs from here towards the north, and it has two reservoirs. Reservoir number two, that is located upstream, and reservoir number five, that is located downstream. Farmer number one is the farmer living here in this hatchet area. This farmer is a rancher that has a large comp portion of his property under rain-fed conditions to grow food for the cattle, you know, like grass for the cattle, rain-fed. But he has two center pivots where he can grow some uh, irrigated crops. And he uses groundwater to run the center pivots, right? Farmer number two is another big rancher, and he has even more land under rain-fed conditions, right, to, to grow grass. And he has a center pivot that is taking water from reservoir number five that is located downstream. Now we have two more ranchers. Rancher, rancher number three, or this is a farmer, grows mostly uh, irrigated crops, and he is the first one to take water from reservoir number two. Re so farmer number three, first one to get water from, number, from reservoir upstream. And then we have a fourth farmer, four farmers, not that many, let's see if you can follow me. Uh, farmer number four is basically a cluster of small farmers, subsistence farmers that are under a government program that has helped them develop wells to extract groundwater. But they can also access water from reservoir number five. So now surface water is free. If they can access surface water, they're going to do it because accessing groundwater requires turning on the pumps and paying for the electricity, right? So this water costs money. So if they don't have to do it, they will use surface water that is free. So uh, let's see how 
um, a potential drought if the f farmers feel that it's going to be a drought next, next year, what you're going to do. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to simulate a 40% reduction in rainfall, right? And how farmers are going to react to this precipitation shortfall. So first I'm going to run you through the um, hydrologic impact of the drought and uh, the, the water availability for those farmers. So reservoir number two, located upstream, right? So it works like this. The squiggly line is the volume of water stored in the reservoir. And the black line is the volume under baseline conditions. The red line is the volume under the reduction in, in precipitation inputs. And the straight lines is the amount of water that is being diverted to irrigate out of this reservoir, right? So during the rainy season, they don't need to irrigate. Most of the rain comes and uh, the plants are happy. They will start irrigating at the end of the rainy season, the shoulder season, a little bit, right? And then they grow another crop during the dry season. They fully irrigate. So during regular conditions, during baseline conditions, they are extracting about 80 cubic meters per hour to irrigate from this reservoir. Now, during the drought, they won't be able to retrieve water at the same rate, a little less, but it's not a whole lot less, right? They're, they're reducing the extraction by five to 10%, right? Farmer number three, extracting so hard that at the end they end up drying the pond. Volume goes down. So what happens in the, in the reservoir downstream, this, the, this one here, again, you know, like squiggle and its volume, they don't need to irrigate during the rainy season. And during the dry conditions, they can almost irrigate at the same rate because there is water in the pond, right, from, the, from rain and some upstream uh, inflows, right? So they can grow happy. But the second crop that they grow the, during the dry season, look, during the baseline conditions, they retrieve about 38 cubic meters per hour. During the, during the drought, they see how the neighbors upstream have intensified the extractions to their dismay. Now they get double warmed. They don't get the precipitation, and they get less water because the gas upstream have been abusing the system. So now they can only retrieve about like 20% of the water that they used to retrieve during baseline. So what's the economic impact on them, right? So this is the hydrologic impact. Well, let me, let me walk, walk you through what happens in the groundwater system. So the farmers that have access to the groundwater system, they use a little bit percent of groundwater used for irrigation to finish growing the crops from the previous season. Then they don't need to extract water or irrigate during the baseline. The baseline is this dash line here. And then they don't need to use groundwater at all the rest of the year during baseline conditions. Now during the drought, they're going to find that the pond downstream is running dry and it's starting to be profitable for them to turn on the pumps and pay for the electricity, right? And use 20% to supplement surface water irrigation, right? And this happens even though during drought conditions, the depth to the groundwater table is deeper. So lifting the water might be more expensive. So what's the economic impact of this situation? So um, what we're seeing here is change with respect to the baseline, right? So the bars going down is negative change. The bars going up is positive change in percentage with respect to the baseline, which is 0%, right? So and we have the four farmers here with those colors. And we're going to look first in changing land allocation. What's, what's going to happen? The farmers that have access to water, which is farmer number three and farmer number, number four, the no, non-branching farmers, what they're going to do is, if there is no water, they're going to reduce the amount of land that they had dedicated to pasture. So this is the product that they are growing. And D at the end of the name indicates that it's dry, it's rain fed, and the I in, it indicates that it's irrigated. So what they're going to do is that they're going to reduce the land allocated to pasture. So yeah, if there's going to be less rain, I'm going to plant less pasture. And I'm going to do is I'm going to put this land into other things. So I'm going to grow some veggies. And they're going to increase land in other products that are irrigated, right? So the farmers that don't have that much access to water, what they're going to do is they're going to reduce the area allocated to soybeans that is very sensitive to water stress, right? And the sensitive for cold. And they are going to increase the land a little bit allocated to sorghum that is also dry, but is a little bit more drought resistant, right? And what they're going to do is they're going to increase the amount of activity in the center pivot, right? They're going to grow some more irrigated corn and some more irrigated beans. So what happens to, this is how they're going to redistribute the land now in, in, in between the different crops. Now, what happens to the water? So uh, most of them will have to reduce water, right? So stress irrigate some of the crops, except who? Farmer number three, that not only during a drought, 
cools himself from using more water, but it's going to start using more irrigation. It's going to irrigate more the limes and the veggies and the corn because he has expanded the area of those crops, right? So the other things they do, they reduce costs, as in the previous example, right? So what's the changes in higher labor? So what they, what's going to happen is that because now they're, pa they're having less area dedicated to pasture, they're going to hire less people on dry land pasture, right? And uh, they're going to hire less people on, on soybeans, right? And they're going to reallocate some of this labor to work on the other crops that they have increased. But the net change is negative, so there's going to be less people hired, so there is less expenses in hiring, right? So with all the change in profits for all the crops is that um, pasture is going to get, um, so the, the, biggest, the biggest losses in profits are going to come from pastures, right? Because they, they're reducing it the most and soybeans, but they're going to increase a little bit the revenues that compensates from land sedges and orchards and corn and other things. So if we were, we can run this experiment to see how um, farmers are being affected with droughts of different intensity. So we can run the simulation for 20% reduction in precipitation, 40%, 50%, and look at the overall impact in the overall economies. And this is what I'm showing here. So this is percent reduction in precipitation, and this is the change in total profits. And we see that for the four farmers, the impact of drought is very different. Who are the ones that are getting the worst situation? Farmer number one, and, oh sorry, yeah, farmer number one and farmer number two. Those are the farmers that had a lot of rain-fed crops, right? Very exposed to variability uh, in the weather and precipitation shortfalls. But farmer number two, gets even worse because he's the one located downstream. The little irrigation he could do, he couldn't do it because he was retrieving water from the end of the pipeline, right, when all the other guys were taking a lot of water, right? So this guy's probably going to go bankrupt. But look what happens to those two farmers, farmer number three and farmer number four. They're weathering. They're coping very well, even with severe reductions in precipitation for different reasons. Farmer number, th uh, farmer number three, because he has the first access to water, he said, uh, the, head of the pipeline, right? No water allocation, so I use it all I want, even though it's, it's like affecting negatively the neighbor, right? So he's doing fine. But farmer number four, because he has some access to groundwater, right? So this is like an example of like a, a good policy that will reduce the exposure of farmers to weather variability, right? So there's a little draw. They're not making as much money, but they're not going bankrupt, perhaps, right? So. Uh, this example from two locations that have very successful farming and that uh, they have more worst, m m biggest, bigger water restrictions, right? So the, um, the conclusions of those studies is that, yeah, hydroeconomic models, so sophisticated tools, they're very valuable to inform policy, right? We can build very smart policy and better water management, right, that maximizes the value of water, right? So. The impacts of, of water shortage on rural economies is complex, right? 30% reduction in precipitation doesn't mean 30% reduction in revenues, right? The losses do not scale with water shortage. And the reason for this is that farmers can re react to reduced access to water, right? By reallocating resources and reducing costs, right? To maintain profitability high. The relative location of individual farmers also matters, right? So it's important to have policy that ensures and fair and equal access of water to all farmers regardless of their location, right? So to prevent ec economic imbalance in rural, in rural systems. So the end, are we running out of water? No, we're not running out of water, they have plenty. Now, we can refine the question, are we running out of quality and accessible water? And the answer again is no. You know, we calculate the volumes that we have in Montana and I would say that we have still a lot of quality and access water. Are we running out of cheap water? That might be, it's for some regions at least, right? But this is not a problem of, it's not a biophysical problem, it's not a physical problem that we, there is no drops in the air, right? Or drops in the ground. So it's a, it's a, it's a policy, it's a management problem, right? So public investment to develop more water, right? Uh, for agriculture may reduce the water constraint that it might be experienced in some regions, right? Um, so in, more, in, most cases, in most cases, um, the, um, you know, our ability or to increase or maintain at least irrigation is not due to climate variability 
or due to lack of technical knowledge, right? We know how to move water and there's plenty of, of water. It's mostly um, we're not developing enough water perhaps, right? Uh, so adequate policy informed by the best information available and our best models can ensure that we'll have an equitable and rational access to, to water, right, that promotes rural and economic development while minimizing environmental impacts. So the kind of policies that I've seen working in other places, right, and I may offer an opportunity, and I, I'm not a policymaker, I'm not an economist, I just work with them, and what they tell me is that in other regions, investment, public investment in surface and groundwater development, you know, has been working. Uh, incentives to switch to more efficient irrigation systems, right? We simulate that in our models and actually can have an impact, you know, like grants to farmers to switch from flood irrigation to center pivots or sprinklers, right, if, if possible. Updating or retrofitting our ditches, right, and lining them to prevent leakage, right, losses during transport. Uh, revise water rights and allocation rules, right? Because some of them are old and they do not work. And I understand this is more a political problem, but again, it's not a problem that we are running out of water. We are running out of the developed water, right? And finally, uh, you can sit here, but um, one of the byproducts of the model is we can calculate the value that farmers give to water. And this is something very interesting to explore the possibility of developing water markets, right? If you have water that you're not using, and it has value somewhere else, maybe you can just sell your water rights, right? Get value for your water, so you're benefited and you're benefiting also the other farmers in a different location, right? It's a win-win situation, yeah? So yeah, with this, I wanna conclude the talk and I wanna uh, acknowledge the uh, work of some grad students that have been helping me carry out this project, especially my two PhD students, uh, Nick is about to graduate and then some master's students and undergrad students. Thank you. So it sounds as though we're still okay even with David Duncan doing his little uh, turn off that water. Okay, so it's time for questions. You all know the drill. Um, Sue and Angela are gonna have microphones. So I think we have a, um, Angela, right down here in the front row. How about we start with Tom, um, and then we'll just point out the questions to you. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Marco, it seems like uh, this might be a particularly good summer for the uh, model you you showed to be tested in the California Central Valley. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, and, but your two columns were 30 percent and 50 percent reduction. Will you need a third column? Which is like 100 percent. Let's do it. Eighty percent. Eighty percent. Yeah. Uh, I've seen those images and uh, from the satellite um, that is show like the reduced area uh, in the amount of snow in the in the, in the, in the Sierra Nevadas, and yeah, they're, they're, in, they're in serious trouble, and they are like starting to you know like pull all the em emergency levers. Something that I know from my studies is that the reduction. Evaluating the amount of water by the uh, extent of the white that you see from an aerial photography is not very accurate because the thing that retreats the fastest is the region that actually of snow that contains very little water, right? So you can see a dramatic reduction in the snowpack, but it's containing like just a small percentage of the total volume, right? The total volume is in the book, and this one is like really high up on top. So. So I, I've, I've talked to some to some colleagues in California, and they say, yeah, the situation is bad, but it's not as bad as you know, like what the pictures show, show right? So they'll define, and they're going to define because uh, they. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to say that California doesn't have problems with water; <laughs> they have like their share. But boy, you know, like they have, they use a lot of water. And they are managing it, you know, like they're like, they carry on, you know, like, and they have a very productive agriculture, right? Um, so the answer to your question is yes. So we're gonna run some simulations and we're gonna see um, how they're gonna do. Uh, we are just coming out of a big drought too, you know, like many, many of you may have not even heard of, you know, like the drought that we ended in 2012. Why don't we hear about this, right? And it's, it's a drought that is very intense with the same, you know, I, I'm not quite sure if it is the same as, you know, the dust bowl, you know, like period. But we don't hear about this because now 
the policy instruments that uh, uh, farmers have will help them mitigate the, uh, the effect of droughts, right? For one thing, they have farmers insurance. It's called, cool. you don't go bankrupt, right? Back in the day, you would go bankrupt with a, with a drought, right? But also, you know, like proper water policy. Now, the effect of, of a drought is less severe than it was like, say, you know, in the last century or, or early in the 20th century. And this is, yeah, proper policy, proper uh, distribution of water, the um, insurance companies, right? And we may see a little bit of an increase in, a, in the price of, of food, but again, you know, like we are not paying actual the actual value for that for that for for that one thing, right? So, but we all want cheap food. I, I love cheap food, and I eat it several times a day if I can. F cheap and expensive. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah. So um, again, if we ever if we ever start getting seriously constrained, we're going to see that increase in price of food. Uh, the increase in the price of water, and that may increase the price of food, will make us useless. Well, this is the same as gasoline, right? Uh, gas, you know, like, why we're less concerned about, there's less gas and we, yeah. there's still gas for everybody, right? Just to increase the price. Which probably is not very popular, but at some point that's the way. Yeah? It's the, Models that you were showing were talking about a drought and <coughs> expecting recovery, but w your first maps were showing uh, some total climate changes and uh, reduction in water. Will agriculture have to move from some of the places it is, such as the Central Valley in California, to other areas where there is more water precipitation as well as irrigation water? Uh, yeah, so the agriculture is not going to move because you're going to you kind of move your lot, right? The lot is tied to the place where it where it exists. But what it can what it can move is the kind of crops that we grow, right? The crop mix will be changing, and we're going to be adapting it. Farmers are going to adapt it according to like the changes in the in the amount of precipitation that they're expecting. And something very interesting is that uh, many farmers. Perhaps so less so here in, in the United in the United States because there is a lot of information. But you know, like when I was working in Brazil, they react not on they react on the perception of the weather, not on what the weather is like in reality or whatever scientists may tell them of what's going to happen, right? And the perception of risk is sometimes very very different. Sometimes here even in Montana, right? You know, like. You know, no matter what scientists tell some ranchers, you know, they are skeptical. They're going to continue doing the thing. But they do believe in droughts because they do happen, right? And they have experienced them, right? So the, the trend is that, yeah, so they're going to be slowly adapting as climate change, but it's going to be a slow, a slow progress. And they can mitigate in part. And yeah, so some farmers that do not mitigate fast enough, they don't invest in irrigation, or if there is not a proper policy in place, some of them will have to move, yeah? Um, yeah, so um, that, that's the thing with, with water, especially in uh, systems that are very exposed to variability, like rain-fed systems. And a lot of Montana depends on, yeah, it's growing rain-fed crops for ranching. And yeah. Bill Wusner. He's never given me an easy question. <laughs> so, um, you know, you've talked about California and you've, you've uh, talked about uh, Brazil and you've, you talk about Montana some in what you're doing. Yeah, so. So uh, could you, could you uh, tell us a little bit about what you need to do next to try to sort of tune the model to deal with Montana things? Yeah. And then could you comment on whether there's interest in state government or in any of that kind of thing related to the kind of work that you're trying to do? Yeah, so I've been, uh, yeah, I've been in touch with some uh, of the uh, hydrologists in the, uh, in the Department of Nat uh, Natural Resource and Conservation in Helena, and they're very interested in this kind of tool uh, to test different policy options, and I have even talked to some of the legislators, so there is, there is some interest, but there's no money 
for, to implement, so they want the product without having to pay for it. And I am happy, I'm happy to offer the answers, but you know, like I'm doing it. I have a student allocated now to developing these models for the beta root, where there is like plenty of irrigated agriculture, especially alfalfa, that is um, very uh, consumes a lot of water, right, and affects the stream flow in the beta root, which is a stream that has, you know, important. Uh, fi fish, right, trout, and, uh, and recreational value. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're developing those models uh, for a couple of pilot projects in the Bitterroot and in some other locations uh, and use that as a portfolio to see what the models can do for Montana, right, and see if they want to expand that. And my ultimate goal is to develop a statewide um, simulator that can simulate uh, uh, the effect of policy and, and, and climate on, on uh, Montana's agriculture. Uh, yeah, so and I'm in collaboration also with um, some of the uh, resource economists uh, at Montana State University, because they have the, uh, they are the land grant university. But yeah, so I'm, I'm moving all my operation to Montana. So I'm bringing the experience from you know, like abroad, and uh, yeah, I want to develop those tools for, for our state. Marco, do you predict in the future that we could see a water pipeline running from the northern states to California and Arizona in 50 years or maybe 100 years or less? Uh, no. I, I don't know. I'm not, yeah, I'm, my crystal ball has never worked very well. But, yeah, you know, like it's, uh, as I said, you know, like it's not a technical problem. It could be built. You know, like engineers will come and solder together tubes and cut the water. It's a um, water is such a sensitive thing, right? And it's mostly a a, 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 a political problem, like pipelines running. And not only here in the United States, you know, like when I came from Spain, um, they've been trying to do this interbasin transfer, and people went ballistic. And um, there is a there is an interesting thing there because they're trying to move water to the coast of southern Spain to irrigate uh, golf courses for, you know, like northern Europeans come and take the swing. And they're moving it from irrigated areas, you know, like a major river in, in Spain where, you know, like it has one of the most fertile plots of land in the entire European Union. So there is an interesting thing there. What do we do with our water? Do we produce food or do we maximize the value? Because what I will tell you, every acre that you put in the golf field, uh, in the golf courses, is going to bring more revenues than the tomatoes. So what do we do for our water? Do we, what do we need to maximize? Net revenues? Do we maximize food? Because if it is maximizing re net revenues, why we're growing alfalfa? We're sitting alfalfa. Cows, and I eat cows too, so I'm indirectly eating alfalfa. But um, but yeah, so it has relatively small value. Cherries have a much higher value. So if you're maximizing revenues, why don't we all plant cherries, right? Uh, so the thing is, yeah, so there is so much market for cherries and land that you can grow with cherries. But the idea here, what I want to say is, um, if you were to manage, because all the simulations are assuming that you want to maximize the net revenue farmers, but you can maximize food security, right? Or do you want to maximize protein production, right? For all us to, to you know, be healthy and have proper food, right? So what are the policy objectives? So this is something that I'm not a policymaker, I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not. So someone tells me that and I'll run the simulations and see, you know, like this is what farmers are going to do. Um, you know, like biofuels. You know, if we could grow sugar cane and biofuels are needed, all the farmers are going to grow sugar cane, right? If the farmers that can and have the water and the land. Um, what that's it going to do to our food security, right? So there have to be policies in places, in policy in places that say, you know, farmers can grow whatever they want, but you know, like you have to in provide incentivization so they grow food because it's what we eat. We don't need sugarcane, or we don't need, you know, like biofuel crops. So there's a lot of nuances, and I talk to my, uh, you know, like colleagues that are experts in policy, and I always like learn all these crazy things that that happen. But yeah, so. Um, 
again, you know, like crunch the numbers at random models and I simulate, and uh, and they help me, you know, like implement a policy that actually make makes sense and uh, and all that. But yeah, so uh, it's an interesting thing, you know. Like, what do we want to do with our water, right? What should we grow in with it? Is it is it maximizing dollars per drop, or is it maximizing something else, right? Reducing risk, um, right? By having a large portfolio of crops, or or again, you know, like producing food, producing biofuels. I don't know. Well, why don't we just pop down the hallway to the reception, and you can all speak to Marco over there, let him know.